Well, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Brian Borum. Uh, I work for a company called Weaveworks. Um, so let me just check who's in the room. Uh, who, who had heard of WeaveNet before, before they read the schedule? About half, half the room, that's okay. And who, who identifies as like a kernel developer or a device driver or DPTK developer? Or, uh, okay, they've all left. Okay, that's great. So, so we can... Uh, uh, because I, um, I put on this slide, I, I am not a networking expert. I'm, I'm like a programmer. And uh, I've been looking after this project for, for five years. Uh, it's been downloaded 250 million times. It's uh, starred 5,000 times. There's, there's a, you know, certain things to be proud of. Um, but... Uh, it's yeah. Fundamentally, I don't think I did anything clever, so uh, so I'm kind of glad that all those all the clever people have left the room. And uh, um, I put my smiling face up um, uh, somewhat because I'm going to put a bunch of people up. You know, this is a talk somewhat about the technology and somewhat about the people and the history of this project. Um, so uh, hopefully that's interesting. Um, so what is WeaveNet? It's a container network, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the primary thing we were aiming for is that it's easy to install. It just works. It runs anywhere, and there's a little asterisk because we mean anywhere that is Linux. Um, but Windows runs Linux now. Uh, we have tried this. You can actually run WeaveNet on WSL. So um, nearly everywhere. So. Um, and we, we never, it's open source. It's Apache licensed. We never made an enterprise version. Um, so enjoy. Uh, yeah, what is a container network? Um, well, we had, we had one definition from uh, uh, Justin Garrison, works for Disney. Uh, I, I'm an admirer of, of his work and, and generally the work of Disney. It's good stuff. Um, but he said there's no such thing as container networking. Uh, so that was a bummer because I've been working on it for five years. <laughs> um, uh, but actually, it turns out uh, he uses WeaveNet, and, and it just works. Uh, so, yes. So, um, so more seriously, uh, you know, what is a container network? So the point of containers is, is, is or one point at least, is isolation. Uh, that through through namespaces and, and kernel features, uh, one thing is, is sort of believes it's completely separate from another thing, uh, including network. They have separate network namespaces. So now, how do these things talk to each other? Well, whatever the answer to that question is, that's a container network. That's, that's the definition I'm going to work with. OK, let's go back. Uh, uh, OK, let's go here. Uh, conceptually, uh, what does this mean? So I'm going to draw, I'm going to put up a, a, a large number of, net, of diagrams that look a little bit like this. Um, so the, the meaning of the shapes, uh, the big, darker blue shape is, is a machine, whether it's bare metal or VM or, or something like that. That's, that's, your, that's your kind of node in the network machine. And the light blue blobs are containers. OK. Uh, so sometimes containers are talking to each other on the same machine. Uh, sometimes they're talking to each other on different machines. Um, and uh, by and large, we're going to have like lots of these things, uh, and they're all going to be talking at once in in different amounts. Okay, so that's the kind of theoretical high-level model that we want to. That's what we want to do. Uh, go back. Let's go back five years, five and a half years. Uh, this smiling face, uh, is, is Mr. Sackman, wrote the first version of uh, what became WeaveNet. Um, uh, he was uh, out of RabbitMQ. In fact, the, the founders of Weaveworks all came from RabbitMQ. Um, so he's an Erlang programmer. And the, the code 
uh, a lot of the coat has quite a strong, it's all written in Go, but it's a, a strong kind of Erlang flavor to it, uh, which is kind of cool if, uh, if you want to think about that. Uh, 3,400 lines was the first commit. Um, uh, spoiler, we're at like 30,000 lines now, so uh, it's, it's, it's growed a bit. Um, anyway, so basically what we do uh, at, at that version, uh, fundamentally what we do is we, we, we put a bridge, a Linux bridge on each machine. We connect all the containers on one machine to the bridge. And then we, um, we tunnel the packets from one bridge to another bridge. Um, so that's the kind of the, the, the conceptual model taken to an actual implementation. Let's take that down a layer further. Um, so specifically, we, we set up a, a bridge. For each container, we set up a VETH, virtual Ethernet device. Uh, one end is inside the container namespace. One side is attached to the bridge in the host. Uh, and we uh, listen on that bridge using PCAP. Whoa. <laughs> the room went quiet. No, seriously, we tested three different ways to do it, like tap devices and whatever. And as at five years ago in Go, as it stood, uh, PCAP worked best. So, um, so there it is. Um, so if you've, got, uh, if you've got two containers on the same host, they're both attached to the same bridge, they'll just talk to each other, other over the bridge, and, and, and WeaveNet doesn't get involved. Um, if you have two containers on different machines, uh, then we're going to pick up those packets, we're going to put them in uh, another UDP packet, um, it's kind of homegrown encapsulation, uh, and we're going to send that over the network, and... Um, uh, deliver it to the bridge again via PCAP, packet injection on the other side, deliver it to the bridge, and uh, that's going to end up at its destination. Um, this is, oh, I like to call it at least a distributed Ethernet switch. It is, WeaveNet implements an Ethernet switch. It's a layer two network. It works purely in terms of MAC addresses. It does what a, what a dumb Ethernet switch does. It learns MAC addresses by seeing a packet come in, uh, and, it, and it observes the source address that it came from. And when it later on it has a packet to send to that destination, it, it uses what it learned, um, and it, it delivers the, um, the packets that way. So, so a physical Ethernet switch is going to deliver on different cables. We're in software. We're going to send to different hosts. But it's exactly the same uh, concept. Um, and we also have the same fail fallback behavior. If we don't know where it's supposed to go, send it everywhere. That behavior will come in useful later. Um, uh, this is a real website. Uh, somebody was kind... I didn't put their smiling face up. Uh, somebody was kind enough to make this website, um, pointing out something that we did actually know uh, but if I if I step back, uh, can I step back? Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, the reason it's kind of slow is um, we start off in user space here in the program that's trying to get some work done. Uh, we go down into the kernel here. We go back up into user space through PCAP. Uh, we put it in a UDP packet. We go down into the kernel again, cross the physical network, uh, and then do the same thing again. We we go like up down up down up down up down and it, yeah, it's kind of slow. It's terribly slow. It adds. We used to measure it like five years ago. We used to measure it at 300 microseconds per packet extra latency. Um, and uh, now, you know, you have to set this aside. What are you actually going to do with those packets? If if the next thing that happens is they get delivered to a massive heap of PHP code, then 300 microseconds is not your problem. Um, but uh, whatever. The the yeah, it's kind of slow. Okay. So next next step in the evaluation, we implemented uh, what we call the fast data path, because we have no imagination when thinking of names. Um, so kind of similar picture. Um, the packet starts off uh, in a container. Again, we've attached a VETH. Uh, the other end of the VETH now is in a, in a different device, which is a um switch data path. 
So this is implemented by a kernel module from the Open vSwitch project. This is the only piece of the Open vSwitch project that we use. So we're in these kind of these uh, daemon processes are basically implementing our control plane um, independently of Open vSwitch, but we're using their uh, kernel module. Um, so it takes the place of the bridge, in, at least in this version of the code, uh, and we add we add a few kind of bridge-like behaviors to it um, to get everything we need out of it. But once a source destination Mac pair has been seen to be talking on the container network, we, we set up a VXLAN tunnel, and that goes kernel to kernel. So the, the packets don't do this up, down, up, down, up, down thing. They, they are encapsulated, which costs you a little bit. Um, but we used to measure this like on a on a 10 gigabit network, which we thought was fast in 2015. Uh, um, on a 10 gigabit network, we'd measure eight gigabits of, of throughput. Uh, you know, so it wasn't that bad. Um, and it's doing encapsulation, but it's it's kernel to kernel, and it's delivered uh, to its de destination uh, pretty fast. Uh, so the person that did this was uh, Mr. Rag, Dr. Rag, I should say. Almost everybody that worked on WeaveNet has a, PHP, uh, a PhD, except me. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, so um, like I say, I like to put up the smiling faces. Um, so that's the, the fast data path. Uh, uh, fixed our main kind of uh, obstacle that we had in the, in the marketplace, uh, which was that it was kind of slow. Um, let's talk a bit about how we set all these things up. Uh, so, you know, right from the very beginning, we need a bridge, we need VEATHs, we need to step into network namespaces, step out again, we need to uh, set up some IP tables rules, we need to do a, set up some syscalls, you know, a bunch of things we need to do. So, how do we do all that? In a shell script. Um, we... Uh, uh, borrowed, liberally, um, from this project called Pipework uh, uh, by uh, Jerome Petazzoni, um, who was at uh, Docker at the time, I think. Um, and this project is a, is a shell script. It turns out it's, it's actually really uh, concise uh, to do the kind of IP, net and S, blah, blah, blah stuff. Um, so, so we had our, our own shell script, which is called Weave. Uh, and it started off uh, 350 lines, and it, it has these commands like weave launch and weave attach and so on. Um, at, uh, at peak, it got up to 2,000, two and a half thousand lines. It's not a very nice place to be to maintain a two and a half thousand line shell script. Um, so I, I sat down and re-implemented a lot of it into Go. Uh, so it's, it's current, I mean, this is the latest commit. It's at uh, uh, 1,600 lines or so. It's, um, the features keep getting bigger, and the option, it, does, it works in all kinds of different modes and so on, so that bloats it. But, um, but one thing is, when recoding from these things in shell script to, to Go, it, the code gets like 50 times bigger, because you know, Go is notoriously verbose. But, uh, but there we are. Um, so. What else? We do encryption. Um, we do that uh, both ways with the fast data path and the, the slow data path we renamed sleeve because slow data path didn't seem like a good, a good branding position corporately. Uh, uh, you know, sleeve is a thing that encapsulates something. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, so, um, so a cunning metaphor here. Uh, in, in user space, we use the NACL library, um, NACL, sodium chloride, salt, yeah, okay, uh, to do our encryption. Um, in kernel space, uh, we use the XFRM framework, and there's a wonderful uh, explanation on that link at the bottom, it, all the minute details of how we do this. Um, one interesting uh, tweak, uh, we couldn't get this to work at all for months. 
um, uh, essentially because the, uh, the, the Open vSwitch data path um, uh, doesn't uh, provide any way to, to drive the, the packets through the XFRM fr frame, framework. We can't set a policy to say everything on this data path go through here. And um, eventually, uh, the idea how to fix this, we stole from Docker. Um, uh, we, we put all the packets through an IP tables rule, which marks them, <laughs> and then set a policy on that mark. Um, so we have an IP tables rule whose only function is to glue these two bits of software together that, that otherwise, inside the kernel, that otherwise don't play. Um, and that's kind of uh, a lot of the history of, of this project has been sort of fighting with things that didn't quite want to do what we wanted them to do. Um, that's, uh, you know, the history is, is there in the code and, and some of it I can remember. But um, anyway, so we, 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 um, uh, we encrypt the packets. Um, we, uh, we're doing key management up here. Um, we did not roll our own crypto. Uh, and yeah, some people like that feature. It's, it's encrypted on this side. It's encrypted when it hits the underlying network. It's, it's not encrypted here. Uh, you know, so if, if, you ha if you've managed to get onto the machine and you can, you can uh, sniff this uh, VETH, then you'll see the plain uh, traffic there. But I, I always reckon if, if, you're, if you've got that much access to be on the machine and sniffing a VETH, then you probably lost the game already. So um, who knows? Um, what else? Oh, yeah, Martinez wrote this. Uh, Martinez uh, did all the... Um, uh, gluing things together at the XFRM level, uh, he now works on Cilium at uh, Isovalent, which is which is that vendor. Um, so that's uh, Martinez. Uh, okay, so change tack again. Um, WeaveNet is a is a peer to peer network. Well, the, I mean the the title of this talk is is like no central point of control. And it's a pun on the management style um, and the uh, technology. We, we wanted it to just be install and run, whether you're running it on your laptop or in the cloud or on 100 hosts or whatever. Um, and uh, what most people did to put together a container network was, was they, they rely on something like etcd uh, to, to be a, sing, a central consistent store of what's going on, to to hold all the container information, all the routes, all the whatever. And we didn't do that. Um, uh, so WeaveNet is, is completely peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, you, can, you can start with one peer, and you can start adding more peers. Um, they talk to each other via gossip. Um, so I've, I've given each one a little flag. Um, each peer has an identity on the network. And that, that peer can be present on the network or it can go away. You know, you can close your laptop and take it on a plane and open it up again and it, it'll still work on the network. Um, so the way we do that is all the shared data structures are, are implemented as, as uh, CRDTs, as, as a eventual consistency data structures. They're, they're specially designed so that we can do that. Like somebody can be absent for any number of hours and come back again and, and the, the data um, reconciles. It, it all fits together. That is incredibly hard work. So uh, anyway, it, well, yeah, it has this property that you don't have to set up etcd before you get started, but, um, but it is very hard work. Um, we do this for IP address management as well. We do it for several things, but, but one of them. So we basically take an IP address space and map it onto a, to a ring uh, data, like a distributed hash table type ring, that idea, um, and then spread that across the network and, uh, and gossip updates to that ring. That's how we, how we do IP address management. Um, yeah. Uh, OK, I wanted to talk about the community a little bit. Um, so as I, uh, yeah, I think I have a chart here. So this is the, 
uh, well, it says installs. This is what we get a count from Docker of the Docker pool operations. Um, uh, so it's running well over a million. Yeah, so I mean, it was up at two million. This is the one year, the last year. Two million a week, uh, down to about one and a half million a week. Um, uh, we we see the software fire up a lot. We we don't as an open source project, we don't have a very good idea of who's using it, right? We you know we don't uh, people people write in when they have a problem sometimes, um, but they generally don't tell us just that they're using it and they're happy with it. Um, so this is one of the few bits of evidence we have. Uh, it, the thing gets gets uh, fired up in some sense. Um, a million or two times a week. Um, uh, compared to that, we get a we get very few PRs. Um, we we get lots of people coming along and saying things like, you know, this is just one I picked on because it came up recently, um, and th this is over a period of a year and a half. People complaining about a setting and saying, why isn't the, why don't you change the default? It's one line. Send a PR. <laughs> 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 People don't know how. Maybe, yeah. Uh, um, so uh, most of the work uh, has been done by by people being paid by WeaveWorks. Um, uh, this is the the GitHub contributors list. Uh, uh, fun fun statistic. After being the lead on this project for five years, I'm the second highest contributor. Um, Matthias Radostock. Uh, who is also ex Rabbit MQ? He was co-founder of WeaveWorks. He's still the number one contributor. But all, yeah, all these people work for WeaveWorks. This this is the uh, Mike Bryant is the biggest contributor who doesn't work for WeaveWorks. Uh, we do have a, a kind of long tail of people who did manage to come up with one or two uh, PRs, uh, which is great, um, and I, I would like to encourage that. But um, it is a it is a little bit. Uh, uh, dispiriting when um, uh, people just want to uh, kind of complain um, about about the software and demand that it does something else. Um, okay, Kubernetes. This is what you were promised, right? This is sort of the theme of this day. Uh, so, um, so WeaveNet is is quite popular. Uh, with with Kubernetes, um, I thought I'd just kind of run through what does what does that mean exactly, and and what is it doing there, and how does it work? Um, so, um, uh, Kubernetes uh, it doesn't just talk about containers; it talks about pods. A pod is a collection of containers on the same machine, um, and. So, so in in Kubernetes world, conceptually, the the blue blobs are, are pods, and but the same same stuff is going on. They're talking to each other, and and Kubernetes has a very small set of rules. One of which is that any pod can talk to any other pod without going through NAT. Um, and uh, uh, funnily enough, uh, the rules, the the sort of model, the networking model of Kubernetes matches very well to Google's network. So. I don't know if we'll ever figure out how that happened, um, but you know, uh, what ha if you run it uh, G GK, you know, Google's commercial Kubernetes, um, then this thing with the with the bridges, they just they just have roots like um, IP root, layer three roots from uh, machine to machine. So they have the same thing with the bridges, but they don't have they don't have anything else other than the Google network to transmit packets between machines. Um, they they just use Linux routing and let the uh, let the underlying network uh, deliver the packets to a to a bridge at the other side, uh, and that just works if you Google. Um, it pretty much doesn't just just work anywhere else. So uh, so there is a need for for something to take that place, and and WeaveNet is one of the things that people sometimes choose to take that place. Um, so back around the time this was getting popular, which is about uh, four years ago now, um, uh, the project uh, Rocket, uh, which came out of CoreOS, which was kind of a competitor to Docker, um, they had uh, they had this very simple model for network interfaces where they would exec a, a process that uh, would add a network interface. 
So that became uh, CNI. Essentially, um, essentially, some people, uh, including Weave workers, got in a room and um, and said, "Yeah, that, that should work." Um, and uh, and it got it got named and it got turned into a project. And I, I am I'm a maintainer of the CNI project. Um, uh, but it, the CNI is supposed to be really, really thin. I just thought I'd walk, walk through what exactly that is. Um, uh, so CNI is, is not coupled to Kubernetes. It, it is, like I said, it came from Rocket. Uh, it's completely independent of network and what we call a runtime. So Kubernetes is, a, is in the place of a thing we call the runtime in CNI speak. Um, and physically, it's the the bit of Kubernetes called the kubelet, which is the bit that runs on uh, on each node. Um, so the kubelet calls a CNI plugin, and it calls it right now. The interface is is exec. It execs a process in the in the host uh, host namespace, not in a container. Um, it supplies a JSON config, which lists a few things out, like maybe which subnet you're supposed to be using, something like that. Um, uh, the plugin then talks. I mean, conceptually, conceptually, you've got a network. Some, you know, somebody showed up with a network. You you bought one from uh, Juniper, or you installed WeaveNet, or you're using Cilium, or whatever. Um, somebody's got a network. So the job of the plugin is just to be that little bit of glue in between, uh, to interpret this JSON spec and to cause the network to attach itself to a container. So that's. Uh, uh, that's the idea of the CNI uh, project, um, and I, I, I think it's it's uh, it's worked fairly well in in its goal of of being agnostic and kind of staying out of the way of people. Um, I do quite often hear uh, complaints that that CNI doesn't do this and CNI doesn't do that, and uh, the unfortunate news is it's it's never going to do those things because it's trying to be the thinnest possible layer that could work for everybody. Um, uh, this is JSON. If you want to say extra things in JSON, just add them. Just like party on. Just add fields. Um, okay, that's CNI. Uh, uh, how do we get WeaveNet installed? So I just mentioned um, the plugin runs in the host as a process on the host, uh, and and everything we're talking about is is containers, uh, you know, which are isolated. Um, uh, so we get that we get around that by devious trickery. Um, we we mount a directory off the host and start when WeaveNet starts up, it copies the file into the host directory. So now it's in the host. Um, I, as far as I know, I invented this trick, but everyone does this now. So maybe I copied it from someone else. Tell me at the end if it was your idea. <laughs> um, yeah. So so Kubernetes has this concept of a daemon set. Uh, which basically means run the same thing on one on every node um, and restart it if it dies, that kind of thing. Uh, so that, that's how we, we fire up. We just we arrange for someone to ask for that daemon set. Um, uh, that, that fires up a copy of our software on every node. Uh, we do this trick with um, uh, copying a file onto the host, uh, and now we're away. So you know, Kubelet is now going to going to call the plugin. Plugin is going to call uh, back up into the daemon, and um, uh, that's how that all works. Um, I'm, I observed about uh, not having any kind of central, consistent idea of what's going on, and and of course in in um, in Kubernetes, you have exactly that. You have a, the, the central, what's called the API server, does know everything that's going on in, in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and so a few times we, we thought about, about abandoning the uh, eventually consistent stuff and, and just rely on, um, on what Kubernetes is telling us, which is what everyone else does. Uh, and never quite got around to doing that. Um, anyway, it's an idea. If you want to submit a PR, that'd be great. Uh, we do. We implement um, Kubernetes uh, network policy, which which was mentioned if you were in a couple of the previous talks. So, like saying who's allowed to talk to who. Um, 
And we do that by relying on what Kubernetes tells us because you know it, it's the only thing that knows all the labels on different things. Um, and, and somewhat excitingly, the, the network is implemented at layer two and the network policy is implemented at layer three. Um, and they, they essentially have no connection between them. We just run them as two separate processes in the, in the same pod. Anywho, um, is that all I wanted to say? Yeah, I'll just skip over that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to say. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, okay, so well, that's not a question; that's an observation. Yeah. Um, but the 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 observation was that I. Oh, okay. Do we have any plans to support IPv6? Um, uh, so WeaveNet uh, has has no support for for IPv6 in two ways. Um, uh, it doesn't support IPv6 inside the overlay, and it doesn't support IPv6 as a target on the underlying network. So, which of those two did you want? You wanted both of them. Uh, and may may I ask a question? Um, I mean, the whole point of, of uh, overlay networks generally is that you have some problem that stops you just routing across from one container to another, and that problem is very often an addressing problem in IPv4. Um, so, do you know what what problem in IPv6 you're solving by having a like? Why can't you just route between the two containers? Okay, so you said your answer, your point was that, that you need some pods. Now, my suggestion is that all pods can have globally reachable IPv6 addresses. Yeah. So, you, so you don't need anything else. You don't need me to write any code because IPv6 will solve your problem. All right, well, I think we have to take that, that offline. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, bottom, bottom line, um, nobody did, why doesn't it support IPv6? Because nobody did the work. Um, it's an open source project. Um, Weaveworks as a company found something much more exciting to do, which is called GitOps, and you should all buy that. Uh, we, we never managed to uh, monetize WeaveNet uh, we never made an enterprise version, uh, and we never, we never found anyone that was, for instance, willing to pay us enough money to do an IPv6 implementation. Now, thank you for the question. Any more? One over here. Yeah. Um, what was that, uh, uh, contract race condition? Start? Uh, question is, what was the contract race condition? Uh, so I should put Martinez's smiling face up. Uh, oh, I'm pressing on the wrong button to put Martinez up. Um, uh, so in particular, that, that link at the bottom is not the right one to look for. I, I should have changed that, sorry. Um, uh, okay, the, um, I'm just trying to see if I can give you a short explanation of this. Basically, it, it shows up when doing uh, DNS requests, uh, uh, particularly on Kubernetes, particularly using the muzzle uh, C library. Um, and what happens is uh, it, it does um, uh, two requests at exactly the same time for the A record and the 4A record, notwithstanding the fact that we don't support IPv6. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the two DNS requests go out from the same source address to the same destination address, source, same source port, same destination port, um, and uh, they hit a race condition in contract, and one of them gets dropped. Is it fixed in green or it's <coughs> no, it's fixed in the Linux kernel. Yeah, I, like I say, we, we spent most of our time not, not on our own software. We spent most of our time fighting other people's software, including Linux, and... Uh, <laughs> and um, and in some cases, fixing it. Uh, so that yeah. So Martinez wrote two patches. Uh, he found three three race conditions. He wrote two patches to fix two of the race conditions. Um, 
So this is a this is a you you can Google like uh, why why do I see a mysterious five second delay in my Kubernetes yeah, system? So this is not the only reason why people see mysterious five second delays, uh, but it's it's certainly a very popular one. Um, that that the uh, the nature of the the requests um, uh, they are from the same address, source address, same destination address, same source port, same destination port. And contract does not know how to deal with that. Okay, yeah. Well, I'm time's up. Thank you.